going to present us uh, today about uh, his work and strategies in mantle cell lymphoma. Jonathan uh, comes to us uh, like the rest of our Cancer Institute from Ohio State uh, University. But Jonathan, like his research, was on the penetrating point of the cutting edge there, really preceding the rest of our faculty by about four years. Uh, and it's really his success here, uh, probably in large part due to good mentorship, that led the rest of the faculty from Ohio State uh, to move here. Um, so uh, at this point, I will introduce Jonathan, who's going to talk to us today about uh, mantle cell lymphoma. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks. Well, good morning. Thank you for coming in early this morning to uh, learn a little bit about mantle cell lymphoma. So my goal today is really to highlight a lot of the work that's been done here over the last several years. So. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a whole day to devote to um, summarizing all of mantle cell, but over the next hour, I'll try and hit on some of the highlights uh, based on some of the work that we are uh, doing here. So these are just my disclosures. All right, so just to back up a little bit, and this is a slide I often like to show at the beginning of a number of my talks, just to try and let everyone kind of get a good feel for the lay of the land. And this is often very similar to what I go over with patients. So when we have, there's a whole bunch of different lymphoma subtypes. There's Hodgkin lymphoma, which is much less common, much more homogeneously treated. And then within non-Hodgkin lymphoma, we have the T cell and B cell lymphomas. B cell is a lot more common. And often I like to sep uh, separate this into aggressive and indolent. And then what I think makes mantle cell so interesting, sort of scientifically and clinically, is that it really sort of is, a, is an entity unto itself. So Many patients present with very indolent uh, behaving disease, will have a very prolonged survival. We have other patients that have very aggressive behaving disease and that uh, need to be managed more like an aggressive lymphoma. Often we incorporate stem cell transplantation early on in the course of these patients' uh, care, which is a very aggressive intervention. So it really is a disease that spans a wide range of clinical presentations. So it's also rare. So despite the fact that it's something that I'm very interested in and that there are a number of investigators around the country that are interested in it, um, it actually is less than 10% of all cases of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, it's male predominant, median age is about 60, so we typically have patients that are sort of in that 60 to 65-year-old uh, range. Uh, and frequently, as opposed to other subtypes of lymphoma, it has an extra nodal presentation. So it's not uncommon to have patients that have bone marrow involvement, have GI involvement, or have other extranodal sites of disease. One of its distinguishing features is the uh, 1114 translocation. This can be assessed by conventional cytogenetics. Typically, though, if we're suspecting the disease, we'll assess it by FISH. And in a patient with, in the right clinical setting with this uh, 1114 translocation, that helps to clinch the diagnosis. We also do have an immunohistochemistry marker of cyclin D1. And then classically, it's been an incurable malignancy. Now, there, at, at Emory, we've had some success treating patients and have had several patients that have stayed in remission indefinitely. Uh, but in most cases, and what I tell most of my patients is that if you live long enough, you likely will have the disease recur at some point. So this is what I would consider to be a historic approach, um, which was uh, really what we were doing uh, up until recently and in many cases that we still do. So you have a patient that comes in. Some of them are highly symptomatic. They come in because they develop um, constitutional symptoms or symptomatic lymphadenopathy. You have other patients that have an, uh, a lymphocytosis that's picked up on a, um, on a routine blood test, or they have an, a lymph node that just doesn't go away after several months. But one way or another, they come in, they have their biopsy and diagnosis, and then patients are typically at that point divided into those that are transplant candidates that are otherwise fit or those that are not considered to be transplant candidates. And typically, this has been sort of our big decision point. Is, is this a fit patient or not? The patients that are uh, transplant candidates historically have undergone an, an aggressive induction therapy. And I'll talk a little bit about what some of those therapies are, what we've used here at Emory. Uh, and then they go on to an autologous stem cell transplant and first remission. Those patients that are not auto-transplant candidates have gotten some other induction therapy. And over the years, this has been variable. Currently, most of these patients would probably receive bendamustine rituximab, and I'll talk a little bit about those data. Um, but there certainly is not a standard aggressive or other induction at this point um, nationwide. And then, interestingly enough, many of these patients that got an other induction uh, went on to receive maintenance therapy, um, and th whereas those patients that, re that received a transplant were observed. And at some point, and, and this is somewhat flipped in the current era, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and then at some point, patients relapse, 
Many of them go on to an alternative salvage therapy. Occasionally, we consider an allogeneic transplant. So this had typically been, the, at least for me, my, tip, my general approach to managing uh, patients with newly diagnosed lymphoma. And so this slide has now become a lot busier. Um, and so these are all the different areas um, where I think Emory is really making um, significant contributions to our understanding of the disease. And we have a couple of new arrows here, um, including the potential use of maintenance rituximab without transplant that we'll talk about, uh, and also the potential utilization of observation for patients that are asymptomatic. Uh, we now are also considering um, maintenance therapy after transplant for patients that uh, uh, go on to autologous stem cell transplant. So there's a lot of areas where Emory is very active in trying to uh, improve our understanding of the disease and our management of the disease. And I'll walk you through uh, these over the course of the uh, time together this morning. So just to back up, when we have a new patient, one of the first things that any patient wants to know is, how am I going to do? What is my, what is my uh, overall risk? And so there are a number of different ways that we risk stratify patients with a newly diagnosed mantle cell lymphoma. Despite all of this, I would say that probably most of my risk stratification is done when I walk in the door and see the patient. Because often you can tell those patients that are entirely asymptomatic, that are just there because their primary care doctor identified an elevated white blood cell count uh, versus those that have highly symptomatic disease. And usually this is very evident walking in the door. But there also are, an, are a number of objective criteria uh, that have been developed. So the Mantle Cell Lymphoma International Progno Prognostic Index, or MIPI, has now been around for about 10 years. It includes these four uh, baseline characteristics, white blood cell count, age, performance status, and LDH. So readily, these are readily uh, obtainable data points. Uh, one of the challenges with the MIPI, though, is that the actual calculation is not that straightforward, uh, and it usually have to do it with an internet-type calculator. It's not just one, two, three, and four. Um, KI-67 has emerged as a very important prognostic marker in patients with newly diagnosed disease. And at Emory, we typically obtain this for all of our newly diagnosed patients. And again, it often just validates what we're already thinking about the patient when we see them, uh, but certainly provides some additional biologic information. Uh, I'll talk some, about some of the work that I've done looking at cytogenetics. And although conventional cytogenetics is not necessarily the latest and greatest, um, it still is highly predictive of, uh, or pro highly prognostic for uh, survival in patients with mantle cell lymphoma, regardless of induction therapies and so forth. Uh, recently, uh, not surprisingly, TP53 mutations have emerged as an isolated uh, genetic or genomic aberration that predicts outcome uh, in both aggressively treated patients and in less aggressively treated patients. And just this month, there was a publication looking at P53 expression by immunohistochemistry, which is um, readily um, available at most centers and something that I think we should probably start doing here uh, at Emory uh, that is associated with inferior outcomes. And then we've been involved with a number of projects looking at the role of recurrent mutations uh, in mantle cell lymphoma and in other lymphoma subtypes. And I think ultimately this may be where the field moves. Uh, again, one of the challenges with mantle cell lymphoma in particular is you can get all this information, you can identify a patient as high risk, but at least in February of 2018, we don't necessarily have a well-defined intervention for those patients that you identify as high risk. And so that's something that we're still uh, working on. So looking at all these different prognostic markers, within mantle cell lymphoma, I think if patients typically will fall into one of these categories, either aggressive or indolent. And so the indolent patients here are asymptomatic, good performance status. These are the ones that are usually here in your office because they have to, they have to be there, but they're not really having symptoms. Normal LDH, a low KI67. Um, and then frequently we'll see this non-nodal leukemic presentation. So this is, these are patients that look like they have CLL. So they have an elevated lymphocyte count. They may or may not have some peripheral adenopathy, but in general, they don't have big bulky disease. Whereas those patients that have more aggressive behaving disease tend to have this uh, group, of sim uh, group of signs and symptoms, including a high risk MIPI, elevated LDH, KI67 that's elevated and so forth. Uh, and so we've now been able to sort of separate mantle cell lymphoma into these two groups. Uh, this indolent group can often be observed. Sometimes this will be referred to as smoldering mantle cell lymphoma, which is a relatively new term. Um, whereas these patients typically always need therapy right away. So just talking about the MIPI, this is the initial uh, publication right here. And you can see that patients uh, pretty well separated into the low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And this is based on fairly old data using CHOP and other sort of less modern uh, approaches to therapy. And you can see that those patients that fell into the high risk group right here uh, had a median overall survival of less than three years. 
And so then uh, the same group updated their data now a couple of years ago, uh, looking at m more what we would consider modern cytarabine-containing regimens and so forth. And you can see that although the low and intermediate groups are starting to come together and continue to have prolonged survival, this high-risk group continues to have a median overall survival of less than three years. So even sort of with modern therapy, incorporating stem cell transplant and so forth, historically those patients with a high-risk MIPI have not done as well and continue to not do as well. And this ar these arrows, this was primarily put in for my daughter who insisted that I have some sort of animation. So the arrows are highlighting the high-risk uh, patients. Uh, and so recently, uh, the European group has now put together something called the MIPI-C, which combines the standard MIPI uh, uh, risk stratification with KI-67, using 30% as the cutoff. And so you can see that now we start separating into four groups where you have the low MIPI and the low uh, KI-67 right here that have a median overall survival of 9.4 years, uh, whereas those patients that have a high KI-67, or at least higher than 30%, uh, and a high MIPI have a median overall survival of 1.8 years. And I would say that many studies and many projects in the current era are utilizing this as sort of a quote-unquote gold standard uh, prognostic index as opposed to the MIPI um, by itself. Uh, I think one of the challenges with KI-67 um, is that it still relies on a pathologist to review it, and is there really a difference between a KI-67 of 35% and 29%? I think it's hard to say. Um, but certainly, um, patients that have an elevated KI-67 and associated with, uh, uh, associated with other clinical risk factors uh, are at the highest risk for inferior outcomes. So we started looking at cytogenetics actually during my time up in Columbus, uh, and this was a project uh, where we looked at 80 untreated patients uh, with mantle cell lymphoma, and this was both patients that underwent transplant and those that didn't undergo transplant, and used either, uh, used conventional cytogenetics either from the bone marrow or from peripheral blood, so we did not have nodal tissue for this particular project. Uh, and again, it included both transplant and non-transplant, and you could see, at least in this group, that this, the two-year progression-free survival was significantly worse in the, uh, sorry, in the complex group compared to the non-complex group. Again, this is single-center data, um, obviously with some limitations, but certainly would suggest that having a complex karyotype is bad. Not surprising, comp uh, cytogenetics has been used in a number of other hematologic malignancies, acute leukemia, CLL, and so forth, but um, this, this was sort of our first indication that this was also a high-risk group. So since coming here, we put together a five-center series that included up to about 500 patients that we've used for a number of different analyses that I'll present over the course of the uh, presentation. This is one of the first ones we did, and actually Brian Greenwell, who's our current chief fellow and soon to be on faculty at MUSC, just um, Monday night found out that this article was accepted into cancer, so will be coming soon. Um, and so this was a multicenter series where we included 274 patients that had available conventional cytogenetics. Uh, and again, you can see uh, the same features. So this was the overall survival plot, and those patients that had uh, or did not have a complex karyotype, which we defined as three or more uh, cytogenetic abnormalities, do well. And so here out at 11 years, you can see that um, you know, well over 50% of patients continue to, you know, are still alive and are doing well, whereas those patients that did have complex karyotype um, have an inferior survival. And you can see that that's also seen in progression-free survival. And so the next thing that Brian looked at was, well, is there anything we can do about these patients? So the patients that um, have a complex karyotype, if we transplant them, are they doing better? If we uh, give them um, a higher intensity chemotherapy up front, are they doing better? And obviously with the limitations of a retrospective series, so, so many of the patients that didn't get intensive therapy, there's a reason they didn't get it. It may have been because they weren't fit. It may have been because they were older. There's a number of reasons that this, that, that happened. But at least among those patients with a complex karyotype, whether or not they got an, uh, um, a more intense therapy, which we defined as having a, a cytarabine-containing component, or if they received transplant and, complete, and first complete remission, uh, their overall survival was not improved. Uh, when you look, however, at those patients that did not have a complex karyotype, they did well uh, regardless, but you can see that there's a significant benefit uh, in progression-free survival with those patients that are not complex um, with the more intense therapy and with the um, tr uh, transplant. So again, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't necessarily transplant patients with a complex karyotype. It's hard to see somebody that's high risk and not offer them the most aggressive therapy we have, but it's possible that the most benefit is actually in those patients that are not complex. Those are the patients that are maybe more destined to do well, but if you can treat them really aggressively, they can stay in remission for a longer period of time. It's provocative. I wouldn't, again, change my practice based on this, 
but certainly identifies the complex patient as a very high risk group that aren't necessarily having their needs met by our current uh, approaches. So in addition to uh, cytogenetics, which again is somewhat older technology, we've uh, now started to look at isolated um, uh, genomic aberrations. And there are two recent studies that have been published looking specifically at TP53. So this first one was from the Nordic group looking at TP53 mutations. They also looked at deletions. Um, in this um, uh, study, they took about 180 patients that were from their, the Nordic, uh, from their um, uh, prospective cytarabine-containing clinical trials, which we now currently refer to as the Nordic regimen, which is our CHOP alternating with rituximab and high-dose cytarabine, uh, followed by transplant, and uh, took bone marrow, uh, frozen bone marrow samples, extracted DNA, and sequenced looking for TP53 mutations. Um, and as you can see, those patients, and this is all younger patients because they were all considered to be transplant candidates. For those patients that had a TP53 mutation, their overall survival was quite poor. Fortunately, it was the minority of patients, uh, but those that have them do poorly. Those patients that did not have a TP53 mutation, as you can see, did quite well. They're out here 10, 12, 14 years um, and just now sort of meeting the median overall survival. So clearly an important marker. They did look at deletion as well. So one of the things we've reported on previously is that deletion 17P appears to be a poor prognostic marker in mantle cell as it is in a number of other settings. In, in compared with, the mut with identifying mutations, deletions were not quite as associated with poor outcome, although certainly it would be, it's better not to have a deletion. Um, but uh, TP53 mutations clearly are, are a big problem. And then just this month, there's been a publication from the European MCL group looking at P53 expression by IHC. And for the purposes of this project, they identified high expression as uh, greater than 50%. Uh, and you can see here that although it's, the curve doesn't drop off as dramatically as it does here, that those patients that have uh, P53 expression by IHC greater than 50% also have uh, an inferior overall survival uh, with a median overall survival here of only three to four years. And this is something that I think is pretty readily um, implementable at most centers and that I think we should probably try to do here as well. We haven't up until now. Um, again, what do you do with these patients? That's the, that's the next question and that's the challenge. But we're getting better and better at at least identifying those patients um, that are, are destined to have a poor outcome. So once you've sort of identified patients and, and done some prognostic workup, you can provide some counseling to the patients as far as what to expect. So then what do you do? And so this is an a menu of different options that you can use to treat un, uh, untreated patients. Observation is becoming more and more of a, of a, of a reasonable option, and we'll, I'll go over some of those data. There's a number of different induction therapies. Our hyperceivehead is what we typically have used here, especially for our young, young fit patients. But there's a number of others here, and then others that are under investigation. And so one of the challenges has been that we've never really been able to come up with a standard approach uh, nationwide, and even in, uh, as we're developing new intergroup studies looking at frontline mantle cell, it's an incredible challenge getting everybody in the room to agree to what the correct backbone should be. I mean, part of the reason is because all these different regimens have been studied. So uh, observation was initially described as an option for patients with mantle cell lymphoma now almost 10 years ago by the Cornell group, and this was a single center study that Peter Martin led uh, where they defined observation as greater than 90 days from the time of diagnosis. And in their particular group, patients were observed for a median of 12 months. Okay, this was not any sort of a prospective project, but when they went back and looked about it, patients could potentially be deferred for up to a year. Uh, and as you can see from this Kaplan-Meier curve, there was no change in overall survival based on the time to treatment. Uh, and you can see that all of these, this is all pretty flat up here as these obser observed patients, especially at the beginning, lived for a while because they were able to be observed. Uh, but then you can see ultimately the curves generally overlap. So then we went back and looked, uh, used the National Cancer Database a couple of years ago now to look at the role of, ob of observation in patients with mantle cell lymphoma, um, again using the same cutoff as of 90 days. And we found there was a little bit over 8,000 patients with mantle cell um, that were diagnosed uh, during the period of time that we were looking, and only about 6% of them were deferred, so about 500 patients. Uh, and there were a number of factors that were associated with um, deferred versus immediate treatment. Um, including more advanced stage disease and the, and the existence of B symptoms. So patients that were symptomatic, had more advanced disease, not surprisingly were more likely to be treated uh, earlier. Uh, whereas those patients in the Northeast, perhaps due to the Cornell effect uh, of pro uh, geographic proximity, as well as those seen in a high volume teaching or research facility um, and an extranodal primary site were more likely to potentially be deferred. And so this would suggest hopefully that patients that are coming to a center like ours 
um, where we may be a little, hopefully a little bit more familiar with some of the data and some of the options, may not necessarily have felt compelled to immediately start treatment. Again, this is uh, a large database, so we don't have annotated data for each individual patient, uh, but that was sort of what some of our thoughts were. Interestingly, though, age and gender, as well as insurance status, didn't necessarily associate with the time uh, to treatment. And so this was the overall survival curve. Uh, the red curve are those patients that were deferred, whereas the blue curve are those that were treated immediately. Uh, the red curve did, is, is better. Uh, this is not to say that deferring tra treatment necessarily improves outcomes. I think this is just shows that when we choose to defer a patient, we are, ident we are correctly identifying patients that have low risk disease and that are unlikely to have rapid progression um, and death. And so, again, I think this is just highlighting the fact that there's, this is a lower risk population here, um, but certainly would suggest that at least nationwide deferring therapy is not, um, uh, does not necessarily hurt patients. Uh, these were some of the multivariable predictors of overall survival for all of the patients. So here was deferred therapy, again, which was associated with an improvement of overall survival, uh, as well as young age, early stage disease, lack of comorbidities, and again, the um, management in a high volume teaching hospital, which I think all of us um, are, are, would, are not surprised to see, but I think is an important point, especially for a fairly rare disease like mantle cell. When we looked at just those patients that deferred therapy, interestingly, men actually did a little bit better. Um, uh, again, those patients that were younger and then those patients that did not have comorbidities. This was obviously a pretty strong finding. Uh, I think one of the possibilities here is that there may, there's likely patients that have a number of comorbidities that aren't candidates for therapy. Um, that may have been picked up in the data, in the, in the data set. Um, and so obviously if you're healthy and you're deferred because you, not because you can't get treatment, but because you don't need treatment, that's obviously probably a different population than those patients that are really sick and don't get treatment for that reason. So we then looked, uh, because we wanted to get a little bit more patient-specific data, we used that same five-center um, uh, five consortium to look at about 400 patients um, uh, with treatment data, uh, se and 72 of these, about 20% ultimately deferred therapy. Now, this were patients all treated at academic centers, and so it's not surprising there was probably a higher proportion of those patients. Uh, in order to be deferred, to, to have been seen at the academic center, you have to have disease that at least was asymptomatic enough that you could get in your car and drive to the center. Um, and obviously, and again, as I pointed out before, it, being treated at an academic center likely, you know, hopefully some of those um, physicians were a little bit more aware of some of the data for deferred therapy. So there were a number of clinical features that were not surprisingly associated with the timing of therapy. So uh, ECOG performance status stage, uh, B symptoms, um, having an elevated LDH, more advanced disease. And then interestingly, those pa or, and not surprisingly, those patients that received immediate therapy were more likely to have intensive induction and as well as more likely to receive an auto transplant, whereas those patients uh, that had less aggressive therapy were not typically, or sorry, le that, that were deferred, typically had less aggressive therapy at the time that they initiated their treatment. And in this five-center study, we found that the median time to treatment was 30 days uh, for the immediately treated patients from the time of diagnosis versus 230 days for those patients that were deferred. One could argue, is, is, is deferring therapy for an extra two or three months really that clinically meaningful? In some instances, yes. You know, if there's a, if there's a specific family event or something going on that you're trying to wait to start therapy. Um, but also I would point out that there's a number of patients that go many, many years without having to start treatment, including one patient in our series that went 3,600 days. And so I think as we start to recognize that this is a viable alternative for patients uh, that uh, have uh, indolent behaving disease, we likely will see this median time to treatment um, for those deferred patients continue to go up. This was the Kaplan-Meier curve from, for overall survival from our consortium. It actually looks very similar to what we saw in the NCDB uh, assessment. This was not a statistically significant uh, change. Uh, obviously, that had 8,000 patients, and this had a couple hundred patients. Um, but again, I think would suggest that deferring a patient that has indolent behaving disease is, is a viable option, similar to what we do with CLL and follicular lymphoma and so forth. And I currently in include this in my own practice and have a number of patients that have asymptomatic disease, that, and some of which I've been watching now for two or three years. So, so first, so we talked a little bit about sort of how do you identify those patients. The majority of patients, despite what I just showed you, will actually need treatment relatively early on in their course. Um, and so Emory's approach has been to use our hyperceived followed by transplant for patients that are transplant eligible. Um, any of you that have been on BMT service know that this is a, a fairly widely used regimen here. Uh, and 
we've published on this actually once about 10 years ago, and then more recently, Loretta Nastapil, who now is at MD Anderson, uh, published our results looking at um, our hyper CVAD versus our CHOP, as well as transplant versus no transplant. And what she found was that patients that received hyper CVAD followed by transplant clearly did the best uh, within our own patient cohort. Uh, and these are Kaplan Meier curves for progression free survival, um, comparing our CHOP to our hyper CVAD here. And you can see again the our hyper CVAD arm did better, or I'm not arm, the our hyper CVAD group. Um, and this is looking at transplant. Again, you can see the transplant provided benefit compared to no transplant. Now, recently, we've actually put together another series, um, which was pr primarily designed to look at how well we are selecting patients for transplant. But one of the, the things that came out of it was a, a more updated um, re relapse-free survival curve for all of our transplant patients. And between 2010 and 2017, we had 91 transplants for mantle cell. And although we do have a decent amount of early censoring here within the first year or two, um, you can see that, the, interestingly, our, rel our relapse-free survival is not quite as good as it was with some of our earlier data. Now, is this because maybe we're transplanting older patients that, you know, one of the things in the MIPI that's a, a big driving factor of that is age, and maybe, you know, with better supportive care, we're transplanting older patients. Are we transplanting higher-risk patients? We've had a handful of patients that have not had hyper CVAD for one reason or another due to age or selection or what have you. Um, and it's something that we're, literally, this is about a week old, these, these findings, so we're, we're just working on trying to learn a little bit more about it. Um, but while, again, while, and I'll talk about Andrew's study in a minute, but while we were sort of developing the data for that, when we saw this curve, it, at least to me, was a little bit alarming. Um, about two-thirds of our patients receive a busulfan-based induction, which is our standard induction, especially for patients under the age of 60. And again, our four-year relapse survival for all of our transplant patients was about 50%. So, there's a little bit more to come on this, but I think um, it provides an opportunity to make sure that, you know, as an institution, we're still doing everything we can to maximize benefit for these patients. I don't know yet how many of these patients received rituximab maintenance afterwards or necessarily what their indu induction regimens were, but I think it's at least worth um, thinking about. Um, most, pa most people would agree that, a that for fit patients, a cytarabine-based induction regimen is the best. Now, which regimen that is, I think, is a again, a topic of hot debate, but I think most would agree that incorporating cytarabine is, is important. M I would say many would agree that consolidation with a stem cell transplant is important. That's our process here at Emory and at most centers, but there are certainly centers that are, are very um, actively investigating non-transplant approaches. Having said that, there are a few long-term cures with this approach. We definitely have folks here that are many years out that hopefully are cured or at least are you know, 12, 15 years out in remission. Um, but that's the minority of patients. Most patients ultimately will relapse, and so I think for the majority of people, we still need to improve on what we're doing. Um, and, but fortunately, there's a number of options now available for patients who either aren't candidates for aggressive therapy or ultimately opt out of this approach. So one of the things that came out of this deferred therapy, for example, is do, do all these patients need to have a transplant? Uh, so we have good outcomes, but are these patients destined to do well regardless? And so. Uh, one of our second year residents worked with me to put together um, a project for the upcoming LRF mantle cell lymphoma workshop looking at seven, the 72 patients who deferred pa therapy within our consortium. Okay, so it's a small group of patients, but at least I think, I, I think it was interesting to look at. And so 12 of those patients have never started treatment. So they're now a couple years out, have never had to receive therapy. 19 of them received an intensive treatment, which for the purposes of this project we defined as either a cytarabine containing treatment or they received autologous stem cell transplant in first remission. Most of them did both, but a couple didn't. Uh, and then 41 patients received what we would consider a non-intensive therapy, meaning they did not have transplant and they um, did not have a cytarabine-containing regimen. Not surprisingly, those who did not get a, who had a less intensive regimen were about, the median age was 10 years older than those that received intensive therapy. Um, and I think for that reason, more of them were high risk. Again, the age is a big driving factor for the, de the determination of MIPI score. Uh, and 40% of these patients received post-induction rituximab. Again, this was based on some of the initial data that suggested that maintenance rituximab after our CHOP for patients that were not transplant candidates um, was a benefit. And so for a lot of, from several years, we've been using maintenance rituximab after uh, non-intensive therapy and only 5% after the intensive. So, Treated a little bit differently, obviously a little bit of a different population, small numbers, but when you actually look at the curves, they're relatively similar. And so the median progression-free survival for the intensive and non-intensive is relatively close, and there was no significant difference here, uh, nor was there a significant difference with the overall survival. Again, 
um, you know, with only 19 patients in the intensive arm, we'll have to, we're, we're planning to expand this to additional centers and to trying to put together an ASH project uh, looking at this very question. Uh, but it at least suggests that it's possible that these patients that have low risk disease that are able to be deferred when they do need therapy may or may not necessarily need a stem cell transplant. Um, and it's something that we're uh, hoping to look a little bit more into. And so I think it, it sort of, that, those findings and some of, in, in our Emory recent findings, raised the question of, well, is transplant even still needed? So initially, we found we, transplant was sort of, or the incorporation of transplant into frontline therapy was initially based on data using CHOP and what many of us would consider to be less modern uh, approaches to therapy. And there's been a number of non-transplant approaches that have suggested prolonged uh, progression-free survival. So the Cornell group uh, updated their um, rituximab lenalidomide data at ASH last, uh, just uh, in December, uh, and their four-year progression-free survival is 70%. Now, that typically requires patients to remain on therapy that entire time, and is that a good thing, and so forth. And there's a lot of issues with taking uh, you know, lenalidomide forever. Um, but certainly, those patients, many of those patients are doing well. We actually have one patient here at Emory that participated on that study that we continue to follow who's doing well. Uh, the MCL elderly uh, study was updated at ASH, which incorporated RCHOP plus maintenance rituximab, and they had a pretty impressive five-year progression-free survival. Uh, and then even just using ben, uh, bendamustine rituximab, the median progression-free survival can also be um, higher, and this has been updated recently, um, follow, uh, especially if you incorporate uh, rituximab. So there's a number of non-transplant options that are, that, that are at least competitive with the outcomes uh, for transplant. And so we participated in a couple of projects that were presented over the last year trying to better answer this question. Again, these are retrospective studies, uh, but this one, for example, you incorporated over 1,000 patients. And this was led at Fox Chase, um, but um, Oscar and Mike from our group uh, helped uh, collate the data and were incorporated into the study. Uh, and what we found was that uh, for patients under the age of 65, roughly two-thirds of patients completed a stem cell transplant and about half of them received cytarabine. Uh, between 2000 and 2015, and there was a significant improvement in overall survival for those patients that received transplant versus those that didn't. Now, I wouldn't call this a dramatic uh, difference, but when you look at the median, uh, it's a couple of years difference in median uh, with regards to whether or not they received a transplant or not. So I think for young patients, at least based on this retrospective study, it certainly seems to be a, an appropriate ap approach right now. Um, when we, uh, Brian looked back at older patients, and although this was not a significant improvement, those patients that did go on to receive transplant appeared to have a, a somewhat better uh, overall survival. Again, this was a much smaller series, wasn't as, as well powered, um, and only 31% of these patients that were over the age of 65 completed transplant. I would point out that in this series, none of our patients uh, had a, a non-relapse mortality within the first two years, um, and so it certainly would suggest that Patients should not be excluded from going forward with transplant just because they're older. Um, and so I guess in both, the way I would interpret both of these is at least with sort of currently available real world regimens, that transplant still to me at least is a viable option for patients that have um, mantle cell lymphoma that need aggressive therapy. Um, but again, these are your retrospective studies. Um, we've also gone back to look and see, especially given the fact that our outcomes weren't quite as good here recently, are we still picking the right patients? So Andrew Ipp has put together a couple of projects, uh, one that he'll be presenting later this month at BMT Tandem, and another for the LRF workshop, uh, looking at sort of our outcomes uh, from a toxicity and safety standpoint with regards to stem cell transplant, both the non-Hodgkin lymphoma as well as mantle cell lymphoma in general. And among those 91 patients, you can see that although the relapse-free survival isn't maybe as good as it has been, that we fortunately have very few patients um, that experience um, a uh, that experience a, 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 a relapse-free death, or you know, patients that die potentially as a result of the transplant. Uh, and so this was our entire uh, cohort here. You can see among those 91 patients, the median age is 62, and over a third, uh, and roughly a third of our patients actually are over the age of 65. So we have historically been very aggressive with managing patients that are a little bit older uh, with transplant, and fortunately have not encountered a ton of toxicity or, or at least a, a ton of early deaths. Uh, as a result. 41% um, of our patients are high risk by the um, comorbidity index, and you can see that a reasonable amount of our patients actually have a KPS that it, it implies some level of impairment um, uh, in their day, day activity. And so we tend to be pretty aggressive with taking patients at transplant. And again, 
Um, it appears that we've, for the most part, done a pretty good job as a group because we've had very few patients that have died uh, without relapse. One of Andrew's particular areas of interest is looking at BMI and physical activity and so forth. Um, and so you can see a third of our patients actually meet the, um, the national criteria for obesity with a BMI greater than 30. Um, the comorbidity index actually uses 35, and so we have a, a smaller group of those patients. Um, although, again, it's small numbers, we do see potentially a signal that those patients with a very high BMI might be at increased risk, although obviously this is one early event that is driving the majority of these findings. Um, but uh, something that Andrew is interested in looking, in for looking at further, uh, we have an a, uh, ongoing collaboration with Mayo Clinic look, uh, to work with them looking at some of their data and some of the specific comorbidities that may impact uh, outcomes. Uh, but again, at least at Emory, I think we, we do a very good job of identifying the right transplant candidates and supporting them um, with very few patients that have early deaths. So all of this is sort of leading up to what is um, soon to be open here at Emory, which is EA4151. This will actually be led uh, in part through, the, uh, uh, through uh, Christy Bloom as the chair um, from the Alliance, um, looking at the role of stem cell transplantation in the upfront setting for patients with mantle cell lymphoma. So the way this will work is patients can receive any induction therapy, uh, and at the, at the conclusion of their induction therapy will be assessed by the Clonoc commercial assay for whether or not they are MRD positive or negative. Patients that are MRD negative will then be randomized to receive transplant followed by rituximab uh, or to receive rituximab alone for three years. Uh, this does allow you to collect stem cells up front, and so what some are, some, what some are considering this to really be a test of early versus deferred transplant in mantle cell lymphoma. Um, but, um, but for MRD negative patients, they will, um, again, be randomized to transplant versus no transplant. Patients that are MRD positive or that have a PR, uh, regardless of their MRD stat or regardless of the MRD status would potentially then just go on to receive a uh, transplant and then those patients that for whom they can't do the MRD assessment would also be incorporated and would go on to transplant. And so this study is designed to at least answer the question for patients that are potentially transplant candidates is it appropriate to st that, that achieve an MRD negative CR is it appropriate to move forward and again they'll be stratifying this for MIPI as well as in the, the induction therapy that's, um, uh, that's given. So this has just recently been activated nationally, um, and we'll have this here at Emory um, shortly, hopefully. So then there's the question of rituximab maintenance. And so as I mentioned, there's patients that are going to do well with transplant. There's patients that do well without transplant. But then there's also a high-risk group of patients that likely need something else. And so rituximab maintenance has been a very hot topic throughout sort of the non-Hodgkin lymphoma landscape. Uh, and so the LIMA trial uh, was, recent, uh, was recently published, which looked at the use of RDHAP for four cycles. Those patients that achieved the CR went, then went on to stem cell transplant. Those that didn't received a couple cycles of CHOP and then potentially went on to transplant. Uh, and then they were randomized to receive either rituximab maintenance or observation. Uh, and this actually were some of the most impressive maintenance results that we've seen. And actually, the four-year progression-free survival was markedly improved with patient, for patients that received rituximab maintenance. And so this was a pretty um, uh, impactful finding. And I would say that most of us now are strongly considering uh, rituximab maintenance for all of our patients that complete stem cell transplants uh, after uh, completion of a, uh, I'm sorry, for all of our patients that complete stem cell transplant. Interestingly enough, the man, uh, maintenance was first described really in the non-transplant setting in mantle cell lymphoma, again after RCHOP, that was the MCL elderly study. Uh, and, that, and, and this was updated recently and there continues to be an, an improvement in outcomes for patients that receive rituximab maintenance after RCHOP but interestingly, there's been a subsequent study looking at bendamustine rituximab and the role of rituximab maintenance, and there does not appear to be as much of a benefit. And so, whereas before, the non-transplant patients, I was sending all of them to maintenance, and the transplants, I, weren't, I wasn't. Now it's become the opposite. All of my transplant patients, I'm discussing rituximab maintenance, and the non-transplant patients, especially those that aren't getting our CHOP, I'm a little bit less excited about giving rituximab maintenance. I think this is not, this is not, a, this is not a closed story at this point. Um, there, was some, there was a retrospective project that we participated in at ASH from Cleveland Clinic looking at rituximab maintenance after BR and follicular lymphoma, which is, there's just a lot up in the air right now, and so I think, but I think we have pretty good randomized data now to support the use of rituximab maintenance after stem cell transplantation for patients with mantle cell. So there are other options, or at least other uh, agents that have been investigated. So the CALGB 50403 study uh, uh, administered um, bortezomib to all patients after stem cell transplant. 
And they were randomized to two different bortezomib schedules, which ultimately in the end didn't, didn't uh, result in any change in outcome. Um, but the five-year progression-free survival, survival for the patients in this study was 73%. Um, and this was compared to the preceding CELGB study where it was only about 50%. Uh, again, it's always challenging to compare one study to the next, but the study designs and schema were almost identical. Um, and so this would suggest that at least proteasome inhibition, th th there's a potential role for proteasome inhibition um, after stem cell transplant in patients with mantle cell. Uh, one of the challenges with bortezomib, as we all know, is that there um, can be neuropathy that develops. And for many patients on the study, they weren't able to complete therapy because of the significant neuropathy. So based on that study, though, we've developed here uh, a study using exazomib, which is an oral proteasome inhibitor, which tends to have less neuropathy, although still does have some hematologic toxicity and GI toxicity. And so this was our initial schema where patients could receive any induction therapy and be collected and go on to transplant. And then they would enroll right around day 100 and could receive exazomib um, through roughly the one-year mark, so for about 10 months. Uh, and so this study has been open at Emory for the last year or two. We have now seven patients enrolled. Again, it speaks to some of the challenges with, with uh, mantle cell because it still is a relatively rare disease. Um, but we've enrolled seven patients, including four patients to our target dose of four milligrams. Uh, we have had one dose-limiting toxicity, which was a hematologic toxicity. One of the challenges we've run into is a lot of our post-transplant patients around that day 100 still have relatively modest count recovery. Uh, and so we've had a few patients that we've had to delay or dose reduce because of that. Um, but we've had one DLT encountered so far um, with a couple of patients subsequently requiring dose reductions for hematologic toxicity. Fortunately, we have not had a lot of non-hematologic toxicities. Uh, we have not had a ton of GI side effects. Uh, and patients seem to be tolerating it well. It's just a, ma a matter of keeping, a, 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 of managing some of their lab abnormalities. We've had no progressions to date. We've had several patients now that are out. I actually just saw one patient yesterday who's six months out from completing therapy who still is in remission. And actually, that particular patient did have a complex karyotype um, and a very high risk presentation. And so whether the, tr the treatment helped or not, he certainly is doing a lot better than we might have predicted. Um, based on the Lima data, however, we've recently updated the study to incorporate rituximab. And so this study will be reopening hopefully in the next week or two. Um, with um, a rituximab uh, where uh, the exazomib will be administered in combination with rituximab, um, again, based on those data. So for those patients that don't go to transplant, there are a number of options. So bendamustine rituximab is probably the most frequently utilized option, um, at least in my own practice. This is based on a randomized study that has now been pub was published several years ago uh, where the um, median progression-free survival was considerably better here in the BR arm compared to R-CHOP. In addition, most would agree that BR is probably easier to give than RCHOP, although it certainly is not without toxicity. Um, fortunately, the majority of patients in both arms have responded uh, with greater than 90% um, uh, overall response rate. And then I mentioned before this R-squared regimen, which was uh, developed at Cornell. This was a single arm uh, phase two study that actually was published in the New England Journal based on the results um, with 38 patients. Uh, and in this case, lenalidomide was starting at, started at 20 milligrams and potentially escalated up to 25. One of the things we found in lymphoma in general is that the lenalidomide dose tends to be a little bit higher than what we see in other uh, hematologic malignancies uh, in order to maximize effect, which can sometimes be a challenge um, with ongoing treatment because you run into toxicities. Ultimately, um, in this uh, study, uh, the lenalidomide has subsequently decreased down to 15 milligrams for maintenance. Again, they had a very high overall response rate, and at the most recent ASH meeting, they updated the data and found that seven, the four-year progression-free survival is 70%. Obviously, a very highly selected population, um, but certainly uh, intriguing. So, and then there's a number of studies that are coming soon that we should get some data, you know, maybe even this year or, or coming up. So, BR is being compared to BR plus ibrutinib. I think, you know, if, if we see a big difference there, that certainly would, would potentially uh, result in practice change for some patients. Um, there's also an ECOG study, a BR versus BVR, which incorporates bortezomib into the induction therapy as well as a maintenance question being asked. And then obviously those are not the only two studies nationwide that are going on in mantle cell, and there are a number of other projects that continue um, uh, that, that are we're, we're waiting for their readout. Uh, at Emory, for our non-transplant patients, we have a study that Brian has developed um, uh, uh, with me looking at bendamustine obinutuzumab, which is a novel CD20 antibody with venetoclax. And this is based on some of the phase one data in, with venetoclax showing that, about, there's a, uh, that in relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma, there's about a 75% overall response rate. And we've had other experiences with venetoclax here at Emory and other studies. 
uh, in mantle cell lymphoma. And so one of the challenges with venetoclax is that there can be potentially life-threatening tumor lysis syndrome, and we have had a case of that here at Emory for one of our mantle cell patients. Uh, and so we've, um, our, so Brian has developed a pretty um, conservative uh, uh, ramp up here for the first cycle to try to combat the risk of tumor lysis syndrome, uh, but with a plan for patients to receive up to six cycles of therapy. And so this protocol has been written, is uh, currently uh, um, under, under review with the company, uh, but this will hopefully be opening uh, later on this year. And as Brian transitions to MUSC, we're hoping that he'll take it with him as well. So finally, I'll talk a little bit about what do you do for patients once they get into remission. And so as many of you may be aware, there's been a lot of discussion in the um, lymphoma world on the role of surveillance imaging. And so historically, um, for all of my patients at least, after they completed induction therapy, they would get imaging every six months for the first couple of years, and then we might spread it out to yearly. Sometimes that was PET, usually it was a CT. Um, but th there's been a lot of interest both for curable and incurable malignancies, whether or not that's appropriate. One of the issues is that mantle cell is likely to relapse. So whereas with Hodgkin lymphoma, you could scan somebody every day, but if they have an 80% cure rate, in all likelihood you're never going to find anything. With mantle cell, you likely eventually will find a uh, relapse. And for that reason and for other reasons, surveillance imaging is tempting. So it provides peace of mind for patients if, and doctors if it's negative. I think sometimes it treats us a little bit more even than the patients. Um, it allows one to intervene early in theory. So if you identify something before somebody becomes a symptomatic, you can intervene early on in their course. And again, it feels like you're doing something. So for many patients, the idea that they're coming in and maybe getting blood work in an exam but not necessarily having a scan, you know, they, it's, it can be unnerving. Um, but ASH and ASCO have both had Choosing Wisely campaigns recommending against surveillance scans in curable NHL or HL subtypes. Uh, and so what we asked the question, well, what about mantle cell lymphoma? So Danny Godot was our discovery student um, two years ago now. Um, he is uh, now a resident uh, in, in uh, Texas. Uh, he took this on and did a project both with us and with Ohio State uh, where we identified 289 initial patients, 217 of whom had a response as well as satisfactory follow-up data. Uh, and most of these patients were uh, from here at Emory. And what we found, not surprisingly, is that the majority of patients relapsed during their remission. This is different than what we see with Hodgkin lymphoma or with some of our aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Uh, and then here he describes sort of how, he, um, how uh, this was identified. The majority of relapses were diagnosed by clinical presentation or incidental findings, but there still were a reasonable percentage of patients who had uh, their, their relapse identified just by surveillance imaging. When you looked at all the scans, however, that were done, only 4% of CTs and only 2% of PET CTs that were done for surveillance ultimately led to a finding that confirmed relapse. So the overwhelming majority of them were either negative or there was a finding that was followed up and ultimately not found to be uh, consistent with relapse. Uh, and so for that reason, the positive predictive value for CTs was 49% and for PET CTs was even lower at 22%. Um, and so, again, there's a high rate of false positives, um, and it's rare that you're actually going to pick up relapse when you look at all the different CTs that are obtained over the many years that you follow a patient. Having said all of that, I think if I were in a room with a patient, if I still could say, well, look, the chances are we're not going to find anything, but if we do, we can treat you early and you'll do better, I think it would still be a, com a somewhat compelling argument. Um, so we did go back and look at um, outcomes p uh, for those patients with relapse disease based on method of surveillance. And so um, this was, um, the, the, so what you can see from the Kaplan-Meier curve is that there does not appear to be a difference in overall outcome based on whether or not you obtain, uh, you, you find your relapse based on surveillance or not. Um, we also looked at it from relapse dates. So one could argue, well, um, what difference does it make how, how they got to the relapse? What only matters is after the relapse. And when we looked at the, at the time from relapse date, Again, we saw no significant uh, difference. Now, we do see that right here at the two-year mark that there seems to be some separation. Whether that's due to small numbers, it's hard to say. You know, it, it's hard for me to say that because we identified a relapse in January of 2018 in one way that that matters how you're going to be doing in um, January of 2020. And so I think there's, we're, we're still need to do a little bit of diving into the data, but at least for the first two years after the relapse, it doesn't really matter. How, you, how your relapse is detected regard, uh, with regards to how you're going to do. And so I think this certainly is a compelling argument against surveillance, or at least in trying to curtail surveillance to really only either the highest risk patients or those patients that have some sort of a clinical finding that you're concerned about. Okay. Um, 
And so for relapse disease, we're going to defer this to next time because I know we're coming up on, uh, up on time here. Um, and I think you could give an entire talk just on management of relapse disease, which is probably even a little bit more complicated than where uh, upfront therapy is. But I do want to highlight a couple of projects that are under development or are currently open or under development here at Emory. So for relapse patients right now, we have an ibrutinib venetoclax study. This is led by Craig Portel at University of Virginia. Uh, and this was uh, based in part uh, on the collaboration for, uh, that was developed when Mike Williams came last year as part of the PURI lecture. Um, and so we've had an ongoing collaboration with UVA and have other projects that are in the works. Um, and this is a study that's open only at, three, uh, at UVA, Emory, and two other centers. And so we've had a good opportunity to uh, be a, a big contributor to the study. And then Dr. Hefner is leading a CAR-T study right now for relapsed mantle cell lymphoma, um, for which we are eagerly looking for patients, so if you have any, please uh, let us know. And then coming soon, uh, we have a precog study, which will be a, a combination of ibrutinib and exazimib. This should be activated, hopefully, in February or March. Um, I'll be actually the national study chair for this, uh, which will be open at about 18 sites once it's fully up and running. This does allow patients that are ibrutinib pretreated, which is a little bit different than some of the other studies that we have. Uh, and then uh, Christy uh, has been working with Cami Maddox at Ohio State on an Alliance Foundation study, which is using a CDK inhibitor uh, in combination with ibrutinib. Um, so we have a number of different options for patients with relapse uh, disease. And so in summary, we're improving our ability to risk stratify patients. I think the challenge here is still what do you do with those data? So we're definitely learning a lot more about the biology of the disease and subsetting out those highest risk patients, um, but what are we going to do? What can we do about those patients? Um, but again, fortunately, most of our outcomes remain good. So compared to where we were with this disease 15 years ago, it's been a huge difference uh, in overall survival. And now there's more and more efforts to tailor therapy based on pretreatment factors and post-treatment assessments. So for example, those patients that have indolent disease, maybe they don't need such an aggressive approach. And I think we're just starting to get into that now. Again, for the highest risk patients, <coughs> that's where maybe the, the maintenance approaches combining with proteasome inhibitor and so forth, that may be where we ultimately end up with those patients. Um, and so again, we're looking now to try to improve the use of molecular risk stratification in clinical decision making. I didn't really talk a ton about MRD, for example, with this other than the EA4151 study. Um, and then we need to learn better how to optimize the use of novel therapy. So I presented all those different studies that we have open at Emory. They all incorporate ibrutinib. But um, one is with venetoclax, one is with a CDK inhibitor, one is with a proteasome inhibitor. Those are all going to read out. I suspect they're all going to show some benefit. How do we figure out which is the right drug for which patient, I think, is still an area um, ripe for investigation. And then finally, like I always like to do, I want to brag a little bit about our group. Um, and so our group continues to grow. It's getting harder to fit it all on one slide. Um, um, but these are uh, many of our uh, lymphoma-oriented faculty, and then this, this is our working group team, which continues to grow. Um, and this was uh, a chart that I think Chris started a couple of years ago and that we've been able to add to. These are all the different um, uh, FDA approval uh, or registration studies for these FDA approvals that Emory, ha uh, that Emory faculty have been a part of. And this one, I'm just going to go ahead and assume, probably will happen sometime in 2018. Um, uh, this is the CAR-T for large cell lymphoma. As we know, we already have one approval for non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, but we were in, uh, heavily involved with the Juliet study, and so this would be um, approved later this year. So thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. Yes. Sure, sure. So there was a dotted line to an allogeneic transplant box <laughs> early on, but it was just a dotted line. So, um, so I think that's a good point. I, I, I think that allogeneic transplant within this whole era of novel therapies and so forth often doesn't get considered for patients, um, especially relapsed patients that are otherwise good candidates. And so I think similar to what we've seen with some of our aggressive lymphoma data, if you have somebody that blows through an auto transplant and three months later at their day 100 has active disease, that may not be the best candidate, but if you have somebody that is young and is looking at potentially a lifetime of chronic oral therapy versus the option for an allogeneic transplant, the outcomes actually are, are, are pretty good for um, allogeneic transplant and mantle cell lymphoma. And there are a reasonable number of patients that can be cured. I think it ultimately comes down to the risk. So there's some patients that would rather take a pill 
um, even though we recognize that that's unlikely to be curative versus those that are willing to take on the risk, but I agree with that. As far as upfront allotransplant, there are some centers that do offer allotransplant for some of their highest risk patients. That is not something that I've been overly enthusiastic about because I think even among the high risk patients, there's a number of patients that will do well with auto and we have good relapse options. Um, so yeah, so, but I think for relapse patients that are good candidates, it's definitely a good consideration. Yes. Yeah, so the second question, I don't know if we have a good answer. Most of that work is being done up at Cornell, um, looking at, at that, and so I don't know if I have a good answer for that. For the other one, though, as far, so this, the, I guess the best we have are this, this, the CDK inhibitors have been assessed in mantle cell, and at least as a single agent, their activity has been relatively modest. In combination with other active therapies, it appears that there's benefit, um, but it, at least to my knowledge, it does not appear that simply targeting that targeting cyclin D1 is going to necessarily result in, in clinical benefit, unfortunately. Is it an epiphenomenon? I mean, is it yep. something that hemochromogenesis mantle cell lymphoma acquires, but it may not? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that question. It's a good question, though. Yes. Correct. Correct, and we've actually seen um, so the, the the other place where we've seen a very similar phenomenon is in looking at our sort of aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphomas, uh, looking at MYC and BCL2 rearrangements. So if you identify MYC and BCL2 rearrangements by FISH or other, or other sort of more molecular approaches, those patients that have those mutations or, or those rearrangements tend to do very poor, or have historically done very poorly. We're actually getting better at treating them now. But whereas when you look at just MYC and BCL2 expression by IHC, they tend to not do as well, but it's not nearly as prognostic as, as, as FISH. So I, I I think you're right that the IHC probably identifies some patients that are not truly as high risk. So yes. Initial yes to that question. Um, yeah. The ACRA study is a nice study of looking at trying to look prospectively yeah. at transplant, but your data suggested that patients who get the best, the most benefit from auto transplant are those patients with the most favorable. Right. And badly worse. Right. So that is definitely possible. So within the MRD negative patients, they plan to stratify by MIPI. Um, but there certainly are uh, there certainly are indications that right those patients that are higher risk are less likely to be MRD negative. Um, so that that's something that's out there. So I think you may be right that we're going to identify. I would not be shocked if the MRD negative patients all do well and that the in that in in. Right, and that the, the, the highest risk patients don't even get into that sort of randomization and so forth. So I think you're probably, I think that is something that we'll have to look at. So they're, they're attempting to control for that, um, but I think that's a valid point. Yes. 
Um, probably not. Um, I, so I, th I think that, uh, well, I mean, I think that's always something that we can look at, although we've had a, a I, I would say that I don't, we, although we have to look into the details, I don't think that there has, or there hasn't been a significant change in our conditioning regimen in that period of time compared to some of our older data. Uh, so I, so that's probably not the driving factor. So, I would just disagree with that. Insofar as peak size, filter size, yeah. is not, has changed. And we've gone from three days of a filter size to a single day. And insofar as cell cycle agents like ciperidine may be important in the management of natural cell lymphoma, it may be that daily administration of filter size over three days is not the same as bolus. That's, we should look at that. That's fair. So I was not aware that. So the the red the chemo I guess has not changed, but I did not realize that we had changed that at some point down the road. So maybe. About eight years ago. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it was before me. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, so probably, well, it's, so the, the best chance that we would have if they, I'm sorry? You didn't say what the chemo was going to be in the randomized So in the randomized study, it can be any treatment. Um, I will say that my, my suspicion is that the minority of patients on that study will have hyper CVET as their um, induction regimen based on at least what's, what the typical practice patterns are nationwide. Um, certainly, though, there will, there will be some patients on that study that received hyper CVET that achieve MRD negativity and will be randomized to at least our maintenance versus transplant plus our maintenance. So we may, depending on how many of those patients we have, that may be something we can look at. Um, but as far as a separate randomized study, I wouldn't, I don't think we'll necessarily ever get that. Correct. That's correct. Right. I think what, 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 what many would argue is that, uh, that the Nordic regimen or this RCHOP RD hat, that those are all likely relatively equivalent to hyper CVAD, I think, but nobody really knows that. And I, and I don't think that's something we'll ever really know through a randomized study, at least. Okay. Great. Thanks.